It's called the Committee of 100 for Economic Development Incorporated. We've been in business for 20 years this coming year, 2012. And our organization is comprised of chief executive officers from all over the state who are interested in economic development and public policy that affects economic development. Today, Mike Randall, the publisher of Southern Business and Development Magazine, is presenting a program on manufacturing in the South and why manufacturing is coming back to the United States and more specifically to the South. We've discovered something very exciting. Um, through our research and through the research of the Boston Consulting Group, Southern Business and Development has discovered that we have the chance of reshoring up to three million jobs from China as a result of the increased cost of doing business in China. And um, it's very exciting. It can reshore as many as three million jobs over the next eight years. If you'll go to the next slide, Matthew, um, we have a cover story coming out. Um, that's going to be the title of it, we think, in December. And it's something that we stumbled upon, upon about a month ago. And the cover story, we think at this point, is a defining moment how the American South is beating China at its own game. And you can go to the next slide, Matthew. This is a, these may just be numbers to you, but what this is, these are, these are projects, totals, beginning in 1992 and ending in 2010, but that is calendar year 2009, because I've got a slide. If you'll read down here, if you can read it. We do a, a ranking called the Southern Business Development 100 in the spring. And we asked the states to send us all of their projects that were announced of 200 jobs or more or 30 million or more. Well, those projects in the middle columns are how many projects met those thresholds, thresholds of 200 jobs or more, 30 million or more in the South during those years. And it is really a very accurate assessment of the South's economy. Um, it may not look like it to you, but let me explain. From when this region industrialized after the turn of the century in 1900, we were a manufacturing and agribusiness community, meaning region. And we were that way essentially all the way up to, if you'll look at the 1997 numbers, as you can see, manufacturing beat service in total number of deals, 200 jobs or more, all the way up to 97. Something interesting happened in 97. Service projects with 361 projects dominated manufacturing. That was a big year. It was a huge year for the South in that our economy was changing dramatically. We were moving from industry to service. And when I mean service, we were emerging into a consumer-oriented economy. And that started about 96. If you look in the late 90s, look at 98, service was dominating manufacturing in our region. And right around 98 was the internet uh, bubble, if you want to call it that. Um, when I say we moved into a consumer economy, um, most of the projects were call centers, distribution, financial services, Okay, those were dominating the project list in the South, and it stayed that way for 11 years. Now, you may, during that time, heard things such as manufacturing is gone and it's not coming back. That, in fact, some people still believe that today. But in 2007, look at what happened. After 11 years, of the South's job generating projects being based on consumer, a consumer economy, something changed. In 2007, for the first time in 11 years, manufacturing topped service deals. Now, what was happening then? As early as 2005, you can see how close it was. The financial services industry was collapsing. In fact, financial services was the greatest contributor to the service column through all those years, and I'll tell you how much of a collapse it was. Um, we averaged in those 20 years 43 financial services projects of 200 jobs or more. Okay, that was the average, the 20 year average. In 2007, we had eight. In 2008, we had three. 
The, that, that means that 40 projects in financial services didn't uh, just went away. And the service industry was collapsing, and as you can see, it collapsed to almost nothing in 2009, meaning the call centers, anything based on the consumer economy. Call centers, distribution, financial services, all were literally going away. But something interesting was also happening at the same time. Look at the manufacturing column. We beat services for the first time in 2007, even stretched out the gap more in 2008, more than doubled it in 2009, and in 2010, that, that was 2009 numbers, so that was the worst year. If you can see, we had 368 total deals over here. That was the worst year ever. That was the 2009 calendar year. Now go back to 2010, That's before we switch slides, Matthew, as you can see though, beginning in 2007, something incredibly, incredible happened with this economy. We moved from a service economy to a manufacturing economy immediately, okay, after 11 years of it being the exact opposite. Now go to the next slide. Fast forward to calendar year 2009, which up there is 2011. We had 335 manufacturing projects of 200 jobs or more. That is the largest number since we've been keeping score. Something was up, okay? And you can see over here, 594 projects of 200 jobs or more. That was the most since 1998. So if any of y'all think that the economy is not turning around, our numbers do not lie. There were 594 projects of 200 jobs or more announced in the South in calendar year 2010. That is the most since 1998. Things are coming back and they're coming back fast. At the time we didn't know why, we do now. Go to the next slide, Matthew. Okay, while all this manufacturing totals were going up dramatically, I was trying to say to whoever I could say it to that manufacturing is not dead. If anything, it is renewed. And I was on CNBC in 2008 I go on CNBC about once a quarter, and in 2008, our numbers showed that a, man, a manufacturing beachhead was being formed at that time in the American South and Mexico. We didn't know why. In fact, fortunately, the CNBC folks didn't really ask me why. Okay, all we figured was is we, we uh, were seeing the migration that the South typically sees of companies seeking out lower cost locations and that kind of thing, moving from the Northeast, the Midwest, California, the South, which has happened, okay, after every recession. But this recession was different. In the, la in the first recession recovered, the first full year um, of recovery was 1993. In 1993, the South saw a 22 manufacturing plant bump above the normal. That was a nice little bump, 22 big manufacturing bump, meaning 200 jobs or more. In 2003, the very first year of that recovery, of that recession, we saw a 29 plant bump after that recession. In 2010, the very first year of recovery in the Great Recession, we saw a 107 plant bump. Literally, something was up. And I was trying to tell as many people as I could that this was going on. I just didn't know what it was or where these, these projects were coming, back, coming from. So let's go to the next slide. There's another headline, South Poise for Wave of Plants. Next headline, Matthew. If you think manufacturing is dead in the South, you really need to think again. That was on CNN. Um, again, I was looking at these numbers and they were just off the charts, but no one was asking me why or where these projects were coming from because I didn't know. Okay, I saw this. We do a, a website called the Randall Reports, R-E-N-D-L-E report, and what we do is we aggregate every business, political, and economic development story that breaks each hour of the day in the South in real time. In other words, you can go and sort it by economic development, and Stephen, you can get every economic development story 
that happened that day in the South, okay, in real time, that day. And I saw this headline on Randall Report, and it stated, the Chinese advantage is shrinking fast. China's overwhelming manufacturing cost advantage over the U.S. is shrinking fast. Within five years, the Boston Consulting Group analysis concludes that rising Chinese wages, higher U.S. productivity, a weaker dollar, and other factors will virtually close the gap between the U.S. and China for many goods consumed in North America. Well, when I saw that, I was like, could that be a reason why these manufacturing projects are setting 20-year records? Could that be? Are, are manufacturers choosing the South over China? That can't be. We've lost 3 million jobs or 2 million jobs to China in 10 years. The South's lost over a million manufacturing jobs. Surely that is not it. Let's go to the next slide, Matthew. When I saw that slide, I immediately went to the Boston Consulting Group's website. If you dig into that website, if you remember, I said on CNBC that a manufacturing beachhead is being built in the American South and Mexico, and I said that in 2008, okay? This report, when we went to it and I saw it, it just hit me like a brick because all this report is talking about is the South and Mexico getting up to three million jobs reshored from China within eight years. I saw this and I was totally convinced. When all costs are taken into account, certain U.S. states in the South, such as South Carolina, Alabama, and Tennessee, and I don't know why Boston Consulting Group picks those three, because they're all about the same, other than the costs are a little higher in Virginia and Florida, but they will turn out to be among the least expensive production sites in the industrialized world. The least expensive production sites in the industrialized world. As a result, we expect companies to begin building more capacity in the U.S. supply North America. The early evidence of a shift is mounting. Well, here I had evidence. I had evidence as manufacturing plant totals, totals are rising dramatically. They said the early evidence of such a shift is mounting. I needed more evidence. Go ahead, Matthew. So I made a phone call. One of our biggest advertisers is a small town, believe it or not, in South Carolina. It's Aiken, South Carolina. And they had just, when we discovered this about a month ago, they had just turned a $1.2 billion Bridgestone tire plant. And I called Mark Williams, the, they had just turned it that week. I called Mark Williams to uh, ask him about the, the project. And, and Mike said, or rather, rather Mark said, Mike, the Bridgestone project was proved for Asia, so your theory may be right. This is a $1.2 billion project. Bridgestone did a 10-year cost analysis. The cost analysis showed that Bridgestone can build that plant and operate that plant and make those tires in Aiken cheaper than they can in any coastal Chinese city. When he said the, it, that the project was approved for Asia, I went, Mark, do you know what you just said? And he said, no. I said, you just said our biggest competitor is dead. And he said, well, you may be right. So I needed to make more phone calls. I called David Rumbarger in Tupelo. Um, David said to me, we're working 29 manufacturing projects right now, and about half of them are in the furniture sector. When did we start making furniture again in this country? When did we start making furniture in the South? That all left to China 15 years ago. Okay, Rumbarger even said, Mike, if I would have told you this five years ago, that half the projects are that, that, that I'm working are furniture related, you would have laughed me out of the room. I would have. We stopped making furniture a long time ago. So I started thinking, well, let's look at the projects that have, that have occurred here in the last three years. Because remember, we saw this happening in 2007. So I called Mark Herbison up in Memphis. I said, Mark, tell me about the Electrolux project. He said, Mike, interestingly enough, it's a, they're building appliances in Memphis. Interestingly enough, this plant was approved for Asia. I was like, you're kidding. I called Governor Steve Bashir up in uh, Kentucky, who's a, uh, a good friend of mine, and I said, Governor, 
that GE appliance plant that's going up in Louisville, did you compete with China on that? He said, not only did we compete with China, they're bringing 4,000 employees from China, okay, or, or taking that 4,000 employees and adding them in Louisville. All right, I forgot about the Whirlpool plant that's being built in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I thought, when did we start making appliances again in the South or in this country? We haven't had an appliance plant announcement in 15 years. Here we've had three in six months. Let's go to the next one, Matthew. Okay, I talked to, I then called Adrian Kennedy. He's the Vice President of Marketing for Victoria, Texas Economic Development. And he told me that, that Caterpillar knows about the, uh, redu or the eroding cost advantage in China. Um, Caterpillar has taken 14 plants of China in 10 years. The Caterpillar executive told him all plants that, 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 that are in China exporting to the United States and Europe will be closed and they will be reshored to Mexico and the United States. Y'all, this is huge information. Again, we have lost three million jobs and if you look at the Boston Consulting Group report, they're saying they're all coming back. You know how big this is? We have 11 million manufacturing jobs in this country. The Boston Consulting Group is saying 3 million will be reshored to the United States and Mexico within eight years. That, I've never seen anything that big. In fact, the only thing I can compare it to is in the 70s when um, virtually every cut and sew plant closed in the Northeast and moved down to the South. And if you talk to any of the Golden Age uh, era economic developers, they say, you know, uh, turning a deal in the 70s is like answering the phone. You know, we've had several manufacturing waves that have occurred in the South. The cut and sews in the 70s, the foreign automakers that came in the 80s, 90s, and continue to come. Uh, that's a much more sustainable wave, obviously, than the cut and sews. The great thing about this, y'all, it is any, there is no reason, no cost advantage for manufacturers to go to China, make their product there for U.S. or European consumption. If anything, if you go to the Boston Consulting Group report, they will show you that to, by 2015, the cost, there will be no cost advantage. And what is happening? Why is China's cost advantage eroding? Well, their labor costs have gone up 20% a year for more than 10 years. The shipping cost continues to rise. You have, it takes you 21 days to get something here. Um, obviously, Michael and Stephen know about the political corruption that is in China that is so pervasive in China. You have a supply chain that is halfway or if not all the way around the world almost that was exposed with the tsunami and the earthquake and the floods in Thailand. All of this is coming back y'all and we don't even know it. And is the largest manufacturing wave this region will ever see. To further confirm, or to, well, let's, let's just talk about how, the, how big is this. So when I talked to Steve Bashir, he said, Mike, three million jobs, how many plants is that? And I said, well, Governor Bashir, I, I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, let's see, at 500 jobs a plant, that's 6,000 plants. And Governor Bashir goes, oh, we can't accommodate 6,000 plants. I said, Governor Bashir, they're not all coming to Kentucky. They're not all coming in the same year. Okay, but think about that. If you have no cost advantage to manufacture in China for U.S. consumption or European consumption, there is no reason for you to be there. That's why they left in the first place. They left because in 2000 it made sense to be there. The, the bottom line made sense to make something in China and ship it back to the United States for consumption. Now we are competing 
fa not only favorably, straight up with China, and according to the Boston Consulting Report, by 2020, we will be able, the South will be able to compete straight up with China, not even including all of the shipping costs and so on. In other words, by 2020, there'll be no cost advantage whatsoever, just straight up, not even including any of the other costs associated with manufacturing on, on the other side of the world. So again, I don't know of anybody that knows this. We wouldn't have known it unless we combined Boston Consulting's report with our data that I just showed y'all. Um, it's going on now. It's kind of catching us with our pants down, if you don't mind me saying that. What I mean by that is economic development professionals, because of you know shrinking budgets and that kind of thing, are on the shortest rope I've ever seen them on. Um, some folks have cut their budget so much that they're really not even practicing economic development. Um, what, where these projects will go, they will go to the locations that are visible um, through marketing efforts or whatever that they do. They'll be going to the, the best products that are available, the best industrial parks, the best buildings that are available, the best super sites that are available. Um, and if you've closed the hatch, in fact, this is so big that even if you have closed the hatch in the, in the recruitment of industry, which a lot of communities have, it's not going to matter. Okay? You're going to have an opportunity to create new jobs with this wave. And y'all, when you think about it, three million jobs in eight years, that is no time. That's no time. I mean, that's, that's the extent, Stephen, of Governor Jindal's administration, eight years. That's no time. And again, I'm trying to spread the word that this is happening. Um, we have hard data on it that it's happening. It's not a projection. It is happening right now. We had one company in Louisiana that's moving product or moving production from China to uh, Louisiana, and that was announced last week, was it not? Um, we are competing straight up with projects, but most of these projects will be they won't necessarily close their plants in, in China. Some of their plants will stay open because this, this, remember, this has nothing to do with us exporting to China. All it has to do with China exporting to us. There's no reason to do that anymore. And, you know, China was our biggest competitor, no question. In fact, Tupelo, if you look at Rumbarger, he lost more jobs to China in 10 years than any other location in America per capita. Tiny Tupelo lost 30,000 jobs to China between 2000 and 2010. And now he's working furniture deals? Y'all, this is the most exciting news I've ever seen in 20 years of covering economic development. And I'm going to try to spread the news as much as I can that this is happening. And you know, it's like, well, what do we do now? Well, you know, we've got to find, identify the companies that are making product in China for U.S. export or European export. We have to identify those. You know who they are. They're the bigger, they're the bigger ones. They're Caterpillar. They're you know GE companies like that that are already um, choosing the South over um, over the over China for these projects. But again, I appreciate y'all letting me come by and sharing this with you. It's a big deal to us. Um, let's go and look, by the way, I want to finish up, uh, we'll flip to another one, Matthew. Um, I wanted to show you this. We lost over a million jobs to China in 10 years. That's a lot. That's our biggest competitor. Go to the next one, Matthew. Um, and we talk, talked about that. And... I put the word nutty nut in there because Stephen, from what I understand, I, I used that word in Louisiana Economic Development when Olivier was there, and everybody in your office seems to be still using it. But <laughs> where is manufacturing going nutty nut in the South? Well, these are some of the projects that have occurred that we believe the majority of them chose the South, other than the automotive projects or the automotive plants, chose the South over China. Um, 
Go to the next one, Matthew. And there are some others, and you see how you got Chenier Energy from Lake Charles there. Uh, I think Nucor was up there on the last slide. What do these have in common? Well, this is a kind of shameless plug. Every one of them are year in, year out, hybrid online print advertisers with Southern Business and Development. And I didn't know that because I was trying to look at what projects were happening to identify, like the Electrolux and, and those folks, um, to identify what projects were, and I accidentally stumbled upon 40 of the top 50 projects announced in the South, manufacturing projects announced in the South the last three years are from our advertisers, which I thought was kind of cool. But again, thank y'all for letting me come by and share this with, with y'all. I'm gonna come, go up to Shreveport um, tomorrow and do the same thing, and we'll be doing this just about every other week. And I hope that gives y'all some good news because we need some good news right now. And you know, one of the best things that this one of the best things that, that is, uh, that's, that's associated with this is this. This, is, this puts the South back to where we were in the 70s, which when we were the low cost leader. That's why all those plants in the North, Northeast came down here in the first place. If we can beat China on cost for products made and consumed in this country, all right, there, it doesn't matter what party is in Washington. I know we, we're in a kind of a, a tough political environment right now. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter what party he or she, okay, is from. Or it's, it's, it has nothing to do with politics. It's all about a business decision. It's all about the bottom line. If it's cheaper to make it here, they will flock here. That's why they went to China in the first place. So if it's cheaper here now, it's all coming back. And I hope you all get plenty of it. Thank you all very much. It's just a tremendous opportunity to get back many of the jobs that we've lost over the last 10 years. How key is manufacturing to uh, an economy? It's probably the key to us. Um, as you know, the middle class um, has had a rough go during this recession, and that's really what manufacturing does is it builds the middle class. I think manufacturing is going to be coming to this state particularly because of the raw material access, the transportation access, and the labor access. All of those combined. You can talk to companies who recently have announced and it's been raw material access, transportation, location, logistics, all of those things are important, and labor. And so we find that many of those companies who have been producing offshore but are dedicated to the United States market are coming back to the United States. If not the United States, at least to a NAFTA-related area, Mexico or Canada, or perhaps another free trade area in this hemisphere, all of which bodes well for economic development, business development, and the economy in this hemisphere. If people have questions or like more information, what should they do? Well, our website is www.committee of 100 Louisiana. That's c100la.org. And we welcome them to come on board, look at our membership. We have a short dossier on every one of our members. We've got over 100 members, of course. And they represent many areas of business, from um, business sectors from the industrial side to the service side. So we encourage people to look at what we're doing. And if they have any questions, they can contact us there.